Hello. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you for coming. Uh, my name is uh, Jose Alfredo Ramirez. I uh, co-direct the Landscape Urbanism Program here at the AA. And what we're going to do today uh, as part of the Plan the Planet seminar, uh, we're going to try to answer the question of how do we confront a world on fire? And uh, the conversation or uh, the, the topic we're going to cover today is uh, the Green New Deal. Uh, I am not sure whether you are aware or not of uh, a Green New Deal, uh, which is uh, there's a quite a big momentum about or around the Green New Deal, uh, not only here in UK, but also in the US. And what we did was uh, to invite some of the main actors that, that have been at the forefront pushing a Green New Deal uh, here in the UK. And, uh, and the main idea today is, on the one hand, to introduce a Green New Deal to the design community. Um, and on the other hand, is to engage ourselves as designers uh, to shape that uh, Green New Deal. Because you know? the Green New Deal is not something that it's uh, set in stone. No? It's something that is uh, evolving, that is being shaped. And I think uh, there's no better moment that we have chosen as today, just uh, one month uh, before a general election. Uh, but I think it's also important that, uh, you know, that designers get uh, part of that, uh, those decisions. So um, we have a number of people, and I will introduce them uh, just before they speak. Uh, we have today uh, people from the New Economics Foundation, uh, which is a think tank that produces a number of policies. Um, that produce uh, or trying to produce a sustainable economy. We have people from uh, Commonwealth, um, another think tank that has been releasing a number of reports, uh, trying to detail in uh, what does it mean to have a Green New Deal in the UK. We have uh, a, a people from a Labour for a Green New Deal, no? which is a grassroots movement part of the Labour Party. Uh, and we have a, a action, no? which is part from uh, the architect architecture education declares, no? which uh, also will present uh, what uh, what they are demanding <laughs> and what are the things that they're doing. So um, this all started uh, a few months ago uh, when uh, Tim Waterman, who is here next to me, Ed Wall. Um, and Lindsay Brenner uh, decided to, to write a, a letter. Uh, at the beginning, uh, it was a response to the demands that uh, Architecture Education Declare wrote. No? Uh, perhaps you all are aware of the uh, manifesto they wrote and the letter uh, they also share with the, with the community. And we decided to, to write a, a short text no? explaining uh, how a Green New Deal or how designers involved in a Green New Deal could be an answer to those demands. Um, so each of the um, speakers today will give an introduction of what they're, what they're doing in 10 minutes. And, uh, and I will try then just to explain uh, what we think about the Green New Deal in a, a couple of minutes. So. Uh, so given the climate and ecological emergency the world is facing, it is paramount to support a socially just restructuration of the world we inhabit, intrinsically dependent on the health of the earth systems, and to trigger along the way a radical transformation of the role designers can play in developing design proposals, mitigation strategies, advocacy, initiatives, and activism. One way to achieve this is by supporting a Green New Deal from those involved in, design, in designing landscapes, whether they are architects, landscape architects, artists, planners, or engineers, that critically engage with relations between people and the environment in which they interact, from infrastructures to productive landscape to coastlines to cities. To coordinate these efforts, we need to get behind a project with the capacity to unite all the best intentions, preoccupations, and existing proposals from the design community. This project is called a Green New Deal, and designers should contribute to shape it. 
landscape architectural environmental designers expertise on visualization mapping and spatial understanding of socio-ecological system are crucial to a green new deal project and the challenges it will bring ahead the current condition of the design profession mainly organized as an unregulated service provider for private capital must end and give rise to a new design culture that places environmental and social justice at the heart of its activities. Because of this, uh, we are excited to join existing calls to transform the, the profession, such as the Architecture Education Declare and a Action Initiative, and to acknowledge the urgency of the situation by advocating for a radical change in the priorities of the design profession. Um, to discuss uh, the Green New Deal and how it can change radically the design profession, we have listed a few points to help frame it. In order to shape a Green New Deal from the design perspective, we need to explore and switch to new design methodologies that place environmental and social justice, human and more than human, at its core by developing design briefs that correspond to the contemporary climatic and ecological emergency we are living through. To direct and focus the investigative efforts to place design agency within the limits of Earth systems and to establish ways to define and redefine social, cultural, political, and ecological concepts and practices necessary to achieve a Green New Deal to develop mechanisms attached to a Green New Deal to re-engage designers with the public sector as part of local governments, institutions, and organizations to design and promote the necessary policies that will make reality a Green New Deal at local, regional, national, and even planetary scales. And finally, to redirect designers' engagement with citizens to democratize design and to ensure designers are involved in the empowerment of both so they can make the best and most necessary decisions to shape the future of people, places, and the species we share the planet with. So with this, uh, I want to uh, uh, give the microphone to Fernanda Balata. Uh, Fernanda Balata is uh, a senior researcher uh, from the New Economics Foundation. She works on coastal economies, which aim at reconciling social and economic prosperity for coastal communities with marine conservation. Uh, Fernanda has led the Blue New Deal initiative since 2014, delivering two major reports and building a growing network to deliver a major action plan for the UK coast. Uh, Fernanda is frequently invited by a range of organizations, politicians, and community groups to talk a deba and debate about economic development, coastal issues, and the environment. And today she's going to give us a short introduction of what a Green New Deal means. Thank you. Thank you, Alfredo. Is this on? Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for having me, and I really welcome this initiative um, by the three of you and um, the students at the Architecture Association and more broadly um, in London. I think that's exactly what we need. Um, so um, I just want to start by saying that I am originally from Brazil. Um, and I come from Rio de Janeiro, which is one of the most threatened cities by sea level levels rise um, in South America. So, you know, as it is for everyone, because it matters to everyone, like this issue, this this big challenge that we have, you know, means not only a lot to me in terms of I care about the world and I care about everything, but, you know, my family lives in Rio <laughs> and that's, you know, the place I, I call home and I know that the challenges are already happening um, there and it's only going to get worse. Um, so I think everyone has like a personal connection to this and I just wanted to leave that in the room. Um, so I've been at NAF for nearly seven years, and like Alfredo said, I've been leading the Blue New Deal initiative, um, which didn't have a movement behind it, and I think that's the first difference with the Green New Deal. Um, the Blue New Deal was an initiative led by NAF, um, and we have built an amazing network um, across the country. We did engage with coastal stakeholders, coastal people, residents, and researchers for a number of years. Um, but I'm going to talk today about the Green New Deal um, and and um, why I think this is important. So first I want to just start by saying why NAF supports a Green New Deal. 
And um, NAF has been working for over 30 years on um, what's wrong with the economy, what's, wh why are we not delivering um, on sustainable development, on our environmental, social goals. Um, and we've been doing that by evidencing the shortcomings of the economic system, um, the current mainstream neoliberal capitalist system model. Um, we do this by reframing economic arguments to make the case for new ways of thinking um, and doing economics. Um, and most importantly, it is about finding out what's already happening out there. So. Although NAF is a think tank and it's about you know coming up with ideas and solutions, um, I think in, you know over the years what we've learned is that the solutions are already out there, um, and you just need to bring them to the fore. Um, they have no power and they don't succeed within the current system, and so we need to um, unite with those efforts and um, make them um, you know the norm rather than the exception. Um, we also work directing our resources towards um, people in communities um, increasingly, um, and I will touch on that, how we're doing that for the Green New Deal um, and the kind of just transition um, um, work. And finally, um, which is very relevant to the Green New Deal, um, we work on policy, um, and we're very interested on what does it mean now, um, you know, in, in face of the global challenges that we face, to do policy differently, to do policy in a way that it's um, led by people, that engages engages people, and that therefore has public support um, and political um, power. So, why do we need a Green New Deal? Well, we know that. You know, people everywhere are facing a number of challenges. It's not just about climate change. Um, there have been multiple crises that we've been facing for a long time. Um, since the last financial crisis um, in 2008, um, there's been lots of movements actually the, from the Occupy movement um, to movements around the world, you know, um, in, in various countries, kind of fighting the system. <laughs> um, you know, and, and the people come from different sides. It might be health issues, it might be um, uh, uh, jobs, um, job insecurity, um, you know, and, and environmental degradation. It, there's a range of issues that affect people everywhere. But increasingly, there's that sense of like, you know, and now definitely firmly in the agenda that like we want systems change because you know people started to realize it's all kind of connected. Um, now climate and ecological crisis, um, I think has been the final strand of you know a kind of global understanding of how it is this kind of dominant system that it's not working for so many things. Um, and now you know we get this kind of uh, ecological planetary dimension of how it's all going wrong. Um, and it won't go away. Um, so I just had you know some images there, sorry, like we go from housing crisis to refugee crisis, humanitarian crisis, crisis in democracy. Um, but now we have this target, right? Um, this imperative to, to act. So in the UK context, um, we know that we've declared a climate emergency. Um, and increasingly lots of local authorities are doing the same, and that's happening around the world, but now we must act. Building the movement, so I would argue, and I, and I mean we've been, we are, NAF feels like we are part of the, the Green New Deal movement in the UK, um, and we work with the movement and support the movement, but I honestly don't think that it is a movement yet. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I'll explain why. Uh, but we definitely have a lot of action going on that is demanding action um, on uh, demanding changes to how we do things. And so how is it that we can combine forces um, to build that movement for a Green New Deal, um, which, is a, which is a concrete um, um, way in which we can ask for ac action. So we got Extinction Rebellion, we got the UK climate strikers, we got workers and unions, um, we got the global protest, um, Commonwealth, Green New Deal UK, um, Labour for Green New Deal, and many others. Um, so there's a new generation, and everyone is trying to do this differently. You know, the climate movement is really trying to, I don't think it has yet, but it will, um, because everyone is really trying to do it differently. Like, you know, branch out, not do environmental 
environmental movements the same way that it has been done, which is you know keeping to a middle class thing and you know not understanding kind of, uh, the structural um, inequalities, you know, and how um, you know we're, we're not an equal society and and we are living in an unfair society. And so, how can we build a movement that really addresses that? And then designing the policy package. So those are the two, I would say, main um, jobs that the Green New Deal needs to do now. One is building the movement, getting Green New Deal in the agenda, and designing the policy package. And the join-up plan, so the Green New Deal is a movement and a plan, the join-up plan um, to invest and deliver one, the work um, that we need to do to decarbonize society, and there's a bunch of things that we need to do, as we know. Um, we need to do this um, by generating decent, jo uh, generating de decent jobs um, in green industries, so securing really you know, the livelihoods and um, of people everywhere. And we need to, we need to do this by building um, economic democracy. And I'm going to let Commonwealth talk more about <laughs> those things. Um, so, just to be positive, because you know, there's a lot of, and, and I can't sleep most nights um, because I think of the sloths in the Amazon. Um, but there is a way out. Um, it is economically viable, and it will make the world a better place. That's kind of what the Green New Deal is setting out to do, and I think that's where we have common understanding. Um, not forgetting it's a global crisis that demands global justice. So when we talk about a Green New Deal UK, um, you know, we need to focus in the UK and what's possible within the political reality of the UK and for UK people or UK residents, but we cannot lose the kind of international lens, especially given that the UK is one of the largest contributors to <laughs> our challenges. Um, so I'm just gonna take you through um, uh, quickly, just to set the scene for the next speakers, that I think the context matters for the solutions that we need. Um, and throughout this process, we need to really be honest about what's wrong and what are the barriers and why have we not been achieving our goals so far? Because otherwise, we're going to get lost <laughs> into fighting battles that are not really going to give the solutions that we need with the urgency that we need. So the first thing to say is it's the economy, stupid. Um, so that's what we've been hearing for so long, right? And it's true. You know, the economy has dominate, dominates our lives, dominates everything. You know, dominates how we relate to nature. It dominates everything. And I'll show you through slides, actually. <coughs> the economy, the way it works now, um, it basically sees people and the planet as simple inputs into a kind of you know machine or a model or um, way of doing things that it's just aimed at creating you know more returns, financial returns, um, you know generating money, capital, um, and that obviously leads to over exploitation and extraction because you know if you see people just as labor and the planet just as resources, then you know you're just kind of overusing it, and then the consequences of it that we feel right, the mental health increase and you know environmental destruction and for everything else, all the other problems become an afterthought for the economy. So the problem here is that if the economy is running that way and it is the dominant thing in our lives, um, then it's quite obvious why we have so many problems and why we really struggle to address them. But I also think there's something deeper because the Green New Deal, or in fact, the way that we address these challenges, will have to tackle not only just how the economy works, you know, like how we do balance sheets and how we make economic decisions and what's going to get built or not, but we'll have to change our minds, you know, and our culture. Because the, what has happened, the way that we do things, is that it has placed nature against jobs, for example. It's either, it's either or. And people versus nature. You know, and you can see from, you know, I, I have a critique of the conservation um, movement, actually, over the years, that you know, it has basically s segregated um, nature. Um, you know, it has put it into um, reservations and protected areas removed from people, never acknowledging and, and removing people from their home. It has also placed people versus people. Um, and we know that not everyone is the same. I mean, I was reading the Global Risks Report by the World Economic Forum, and it starts by saying, are we sleepwalking into 
a crisis or something like that. And I was like, we? <laughs> Who's we? <laughs> um, a lot of people are, <laughs> have no idea, you know, of this complexity of things that are going on, but a lot of people know, you know? So, um, you know, the we is very um, tricky and that creates a huge challenge for us as a movement and as people trying to do things differently and bringing people with us. Um, and we need to remember that. You know, when people um, campaign against refugees coming into their area, uh, into their country, I mean, we know from Brexit, you know, experiencing in the UK, et cetera, that, you know, it is about people feeling threatened to their jobs and their livelihoods. And, you know, the, the, how, how that culture has been created, you know, how it has been, um, it almost like, you know, it's a value system that almost like asphyxiates us because we know inherently that we feel differently about things, yet, you know, it's just a whole system kind of, making you think and act in a certain way. And finally, individual versus society. Um, and this is really important too, um, because um, I don't know if you guys recognize this phrase. Who said it? <laughs> um, yes, <laughs> the famous quote. Um, and that was really the beginning of the end of collective power and collective action. <laughs> Um, you know, but we know that that's not true. You know, we know that's not true. Um, and, but, but we need, but, but, but a lot of concerted effort needs to be put into actually reversing the damage that that has created. Um, you know, and we can talk about unions, for example, you know, the, the labor movement, you know, and how they've been shut down really um, with laws actually against them being able to manifest and, and do collective action. And that's what we need, right? We need collective action now. Um, but this whole thing that I described, <laughs> how the economy works, and in fact, how our lives work right now, um, that's, that's not a democracy. Um, that's not what most of us want. That's not what's benefiting. Um, most of us are not benefiting from it. Um, and so again, when I say the context matters for the solutions that we need, I'm not trying to provoke here, you know, like let's go and attack the corporations, although let's do that. Um, it's, it's just to keep in mind because, you know, I, I, I do research and I sit in an office and I'm reading lots of, you know, <coughs> reports coming out and everyone that's doing things and, I know that that's not how we're going to go engage people, but it's it's overwhelming, like the amount of wealth accumulation and power accumulation and what has happened now. And I was I, um, um, ashamed to say I did fly to New York for the UN climate summit, and I was I mean I already knew that, but being in the room and seeing how corporations get to speak sometimes even more than government officials, they are the ones governing the world now. You know, like governments have no power really anymore to do things. And we need to keep that in mind as well when we're talking to government, when we ask demanding for policies. But everything must change. Everything will change whether we do something about it or not. Um, and it's not the economy. People and nature and the planet have always been and will always be more, more important than the economy. So we need to find a way to change how the system works. And so that it does value people, lives, and nature more than financial returns. Um, and I just wanted to put a picture there because I care about the ecological crisis as well and I really care about the orangutans. Um, so, um, how long do I have? Because I might just... Uh, couple of couple of minutes, okay. So I just wanted to mention something about the just transition in terms of the challenge of delivering the Green New Deal. And I haven't said too much about what the Green New Deal policies actually are because I know Commonwealth is gonna be doing some of that. Um, and NAF will be working on um, 
you know, that kind of people-led policy-making um, aspect of in the next few months, so I'm happy to talk to people about that. But I just wanted to finish by talking about the just transition. Um, especially in the UK, um, the, the challenge now is really to build trust, to build solidarity, and most importantly, to build power. And we are already living the transition, right? There are people right now in the country losing their jobs, feeling threatened that they will lose their jobs tomorrow, and they probably will. Um, and actually, that's in the context of um, in a context of a country that has not managed industrial transitions very well. Um, and by industrial transitions, I mean, you know, having to um, move from coal to, um, coal to what? <laughs> um, you know, moving, moving from, from um, certain industries to, to, to others. Um, it has not managed it well. You can think about the coal miners in the 80s. You can think about fishing communities that I've, I've been working with. Um, you know, and the decline of these industries, and and it has happened in a way that communities have been left, you know, with no alternative, with no plan to, you know, what kind of new jobs can be created, how they can rethink their economies. Um, and people talk about left behind communities, but we've increasingly been using a term that someone wrote at the Guardian, which is held back communities, because people do have a lot of things that they're doing. You know, if you go at a local place, you can find lots of solutions to problems, because people have to get on with their lives. They're not just going to sit there and cry. Um, but they held back because they don't have the level of resources and the, the power that they need to actually deliver the kind of transformation that it requires. So there's a lack of trust because that's how people feel right now. And again, we know that from British politics. There's a lack of resilience because of that, because you know the, the economic resilience has not been built over the years. And there's a lack of process and power because the UK economy is heavily um, uh, centralized. The UK governing is very centralized, and that creates challenges for people to um, be able to, you know, implement solutions. And where we need to be, um, we've been doing work on the just transition. Um, and I think everything, like we just live in the just transition, everything is. But when you talk about the term just transition, like focusing on the people, the jobs at the forefront of the transition, you know, in high carbon industries, um, it's really important, and, and I say this for, from the movement perspective, that we do understand how we have to respect really where people are coming from, you know, what those industries have meant to communities and to their places, um, and really allow that to be a part of the conversation, um, you know, and not just kind of hammer like, you know, but it's climate and, you know, it's the environment and stuff. It's like, you need to, we need to talk to people where they are um, and really bring them with us. Um, I'm gonna stop talking. Um, I have more stuff to say, but I think others will contribute more to this question and then I can, um, answer questions afterwards. Thank you. Uh, we have next in line uh, AA Action. Uh, AA Action is an inquisitive, continuous, and collective project formed by a group of AA students to promote education as the primary place to reflect on the urgency of climate and ecological breakdown, being aware of the importance of the architectural profession in the context of climate change, the group works both within and outside the AA to challenge and address the necessary theoretical and practical challenges. And we have Eugene, Angelica, and I don't know, who? Oh, Tong, uh, explaining us that uh, a bit further. Thank you. Thank you. So you just introduced the first lines of our presentation. Um, so we would like to um, introduce our group, especially focusing on a few points of the manifesto that we wrote. Um, and the manifesto is really about a change that needs to happen. And we see in, in architecture, in architectural education, we really need to um, to move towards different uh, different systems. So the points that I selected are the ones that are more related with the topic of tonight and the work that New Economy Foundation, Commonwealth, and other uh, institutions are doing with the Green New Deal. Um, so first point, intersectionality. 
Our institution's pedagogical systems must recognize the intrinsic link between ecological breakdown and social injustice. It is imperative we adopt an intersectional, intersectional analysis of climate change and acknowledge that the threats of ecological breakdown vary in intensity depending on class, race, gender, and geography. We must therefore constantly challenge global inequities of power by renegotiating our entanglement with high finance, the construction industry, real estate, and the neoliberal state. And the next manifesto that we would also like to highlight is on embedded ecological understanding. Ecology should not be an afterthought. It must be elevated and wholly integrated into all aspects of curriculum and serve as one of the primary tenets through which we understand our roles as responsible members of the ecological community. Articulation of a new politics, which is the most important one probably out of the, the other ones tonight. Our capacity to care for our environment has always been constrained, constrained by the interests of capital and other economical imperatives that rely on exploitation and dispossession. Our commitment to social justice necessitates new modes of operating within the political economy that promote a local and global redistribution of power and access. Specialization. Architecture is inherently political, yet the challenges are too great, too varied for any one unit, department, or schools to meet. We must specialize and develop deep competency in particular areas and support the free circulation of knowledge and expertise which are subsequently produced. Forming alliances. In a spirit of collective endeavor for common ends, cross-institutional and cross-disciplinary dialogues need to be established to ensure that actions are not localized or temporary, but expansive, continual, and multiple. Um, so these are uh, five of the eight points. Uh, the other ones um, being diversifying cooperation, aesthetic and canonical revaluation, decolonization, and canonical rearticulation. Um, which were, were pinned down exactly to, to highlight the change that we understand that needs to happen in architecture, not only in the practice of architecture, but especially in, in the education. Um, we understand that there is so much work to do, um, and the architect can't do it alone. Um, so now I would like to go through a few initiatives that we've started and um, ongoing and future projects. Uh, so there has been a summit on climate on the 4th of October this year, um, focused on four main topics. Embedded ecological understanding, intersectionality, articulation of new politics, where um, Christian is from New Economic Foundation was present, and also Julian from uh, Commonwealth. Um, decolonization and aesthetic revaluation. So uh, these were the main topics that we touched upon during the summit. Um, and it was an interesting day, especially for the raising of awareness that we um, we tried to get out of that. And we actually were glad to see that uh, there is already some change that happened. Um, we got an email back from the um, ETS, which is the Environmental and Technical Studies Tutors, um, in a great support of our project and telling us that they're really uh, ready to help in any possible way. Um, then another. Um, and I think I would say another way for us to apply pressure to the institution that we're in right now would be kind of having these meetings with, so director, the, um, so we had a meeting with director and some of the changes that we actually saw were through the briefs, um, so design studios that actually incorporated notions of climate change and the relationship to architect's role in the ecological emergency. Um, as well, a few weeks ago, we actually met up with the council member, um, Catherine Detroit, um, where we kind of spoke about nece uh, necessary needs of changing bylaws of a architecture association, but how we could move on from having this symbolic gesture and actually accumulating, I guess, um, knowledge that is beyond almost like a tick point of climate emergency. Um, we also, we've also started student-led seminars 
um, to bring um, to start also speaking about the different levels, different aspects of climate change. Um, the first one we had two weeks ago was about eco anxiety. It was quite a, an interesting meeting. Uh, and the next one in line, they're going to talk about IPCC reports, RIBA climate proposals, food, for example, and then others that are going to be shaped uh, still. And then we try to reach out for possible collaboration. Which so, I mean, I just landed from Chicago today, so another thing that we're trying to do is kind of build alliances and try to understand what other understanding of climate emergency is happening throughout architectural edu education. So, um, in Chicago Biannual, we had this, this, this discussion about how people move on from education to teaching position, trying to be aligned with institutional structure, how we can analyze a better understanding and embed uh, ecological understanding into the pedagogy of architecture. Tom, do you have anything to add to? I don't no. know what you want me to say. <laughs> no. <laughs> I mean, there are a few others, other uh, initiatives that maybe can come a little later. If yeah, yeah, we have other initiatives with the circle on this. They're like not even like 10% done, so I don't know. Yeah. So, also, so we've started with those initiatives um, basically a few weeks ago after the summit. Uh, so everything is really an ongoing process of trying to basically to ra uh, raise awareness of what climate change uh, is about. But also, we are really uh, curious to know more because we actually it's a really an ongoing process of discovery for us as well. Uh, so there's really a lot to. Um, to be taught, and so we are very open to collaborations because we really, really need them. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, we have also Commonwealth. Um, Commonwealth is a think tank which designs ownership models for a democratic and sustainable economy, and uh, they have released a series of reports um, in the past few months, uh, which I think uh, they may be an example of how a collaboration between designers and uh, I think that such a common board could happen, because I can imagine the way uh, those policies can be visualized or we can actually describe the way uh, they can have impact in, uh, in space. And from Commonwealth, we have Matthew Lawrence, uh, who is the director. Matthew has extensive experience in the design and advocacy of alternative models of ownership, and previously he was a senior research fellow working on IPPR's Commission on Economic Justice, and has collaborated with NEF and the Democratic Collaborative. And we have also Julian Sirabo, uh, who is an architect and urban designer. Uh, he's part of Commonwealth Think Tank, leading the design for the Green New Deal City 2030. Julian is also head of the urban research at Autonomy, where he focuses on the spatial implications of new welfare and employment policies on aging populations and sustainable forms of leisure. Thank you very much. Thank you. <coughs> um, it's on? Yeah. Well, uh, Adrian's actually, it's her first day at Commonwealth today, so you've actually got three here. It's actually almost the entire Commonwealth uh, <laughs> team here uh, now as a result, but it's a pleasure to be here and a pleasure to be here with colleagues from AA and um, NEF. Um, what I thought I'd uh, briefly do is sort of sketch briefly the roadmap to a Green New Deal, uh, which I think, just as a sort of caveat, it's quite interesting that even our sort of mental geographies of like how do you move beyond a sort of carbon civilization kind of relies on some of the core infrastructures of carbon civilization, so roads and, you know, if we've got to fly out of here or whatever the sort of metaphors would be. But I want to sort of set up what it is and then tease out some of the sort of policy interventions that a Green New Deal could actually constitute beyond just sort of rhetoric and then sort of hand over to Judy and sort of sketch out some of the sort of how that sort of intermeshes with design and architecture. So I think, I mean, at the core of the Green New Deal is essentially sort of an, an unprecedented project of world making, I'd argue. So I'd say, if we look at the science, if we look at sort of the forms of intersecting crises that are already here, they're not sort of coming down the track, they're already here, so the comet has already hit the earth in that sense. We really have little more than a decade to fundamentally transform and move beyond so the infrastructures, institutions, and ways of life of the carbon civilization in which we've obviously all been born into and grown up in. 
And that is a sort of obviously a deeply sort of daunting, but I think ultimately quite hopeful sort of and very political project. And in that sense, I think, as was alluded to, it sort of fits very neatly with sort of architecture and design because in some ways, both the Green New Deal and architecture is about thinking and reconceptualizing how we sort of intervene in space, in matter, and redesigning it to have new ways of flourishing, new forms of living and thriving together. So I think there's a lot of um, overlaps and symmetries there. And I think sort of for progressives, um, which sort of certainly Commonwealth and F and from the presentation certainly sounds like there's sort of some sort of shared little moments there, I think fundamental to the Green New Deal is that it's not just sort of a series of discrete interventions to sort of decarbonize the economy, but what it seeks to do at the same time as decarbonizing the economy and sort of uncoupling environmental footprints uh, sort of destroying our wider ecology that we all depend upon. I think alongside that, it seeks to dismantle the hierarchies, inequalities, and injustices that are sort of endemic to fossil fuel capitalism, so sort of the sort of patriarchy, the racism, sort of, sort of extractivism from you know, not just nature, but obviously labor from the commons from the household, and in doing so, seeking to build an economy and a society that is democratic and sustainable uh, by design. So what we did in this roadmap, that was kind of the, the framing, and then we sort of tried to tease apart well, what are the types of interventions you need, sort of overlapping interventions you need to scale that type of shift from a sort of extractive to a generative and flourishing sort of social economy based on you know, ecological reproduction, nurturing, caring, sort of social reproduction that's just, rather than a focus on accumulation for accumulation's sake. And the, sort of the three, um, so, well, the four core nodal points, um, which all overlap in some ways with the work with AA, um, was finance, so the green industrial uh, revolution, uh, no, green industrial strategy, rather, too many sort of buzzwords flying around the sector, um, sort of new infrastructures of life making and sort of, sort of nurturing, which I'll go through in a second, and then sort of a green internationalism. And I think in some ways the easiest of these sort of policy questions to answer is often the one that sort of seems most problematic and is the one that during this general election I imagine we'll hear the most about, which is like, oh, how can we afford it? Oh, well, it's, it costs so 17 trillion pounds or whatever it might be. And of course the obvious retort in some ways is, well, how can we not afford that given what we know is you know, already upon us but it would like to exponentially accelerate. But I think also what we set out in the report uh, in a series of interventions, including from uh, colleagues, contribution from colleagues at NEF um, on some of the rules around fiscal spending, some of the ways that we can sort of channel sort of the, the expansive power of central banking, the ability to sort of create and channel credit and reshape the rules of finance, and some of the sort of powers we have around green taxation to both sort of repress carbon heavy activities, but also sort of provide us with the resources to build sort of post-carbon sort of flourishing society we want. I think in some ways it's a financing question is in some ways the easiest, which then obviously opens up a nice sort of box of toys of like, well, how do you spend uh, and drive, where do you direct this investment to? What do you do with it? How do you reshape the built environment, et cetera, et cetera, through those forms of intervention? And so the first one in some ways was um, a green industrial strategy, which you know, sounds quite nerdy and sort of wonky, but essentially means what are the types of interventions, whether it's you know new forms of coordination around trade unions and collective bargaining, whether it's new forms of direction of public investment, whatever it might be, what are the sort of coordinated forms of intervention we can do to reshape both production and consumption in the economy and sort of decouple environmental footprints from forms of production and shape production, you know, shape away from production towards caring and social reproduction forms of work and in doing so, so sort of fundamentally shape, reshape rather, the nature of work, its purpose, the purpose of economic activity as a whole, which was alluded to previously. So that's sort of one building block. But then I think in some ways, more interestingly for this discussion in some ways was um, the infrastructure of, sort of life giving and sustaining of life. And so there was a series of uh, policy breakdowns on how do we take an energy system which is, you know, has been decarbonizing in the UK and has like got coal, for example, off the grid to reasonably successful degrees, but ultimately, particularly when you take in our sort of carbon footprint in the round from sort of imports, etc., our energy system requires radical change to be decentralized, to be sort of decarbonized quite clearly, and to be much more sort of democratically owned and controlled. So what are the sort of interventions that we can make around that, around reshaping beyond an oligopolistic current present towards a much more decentralized future? We looked at housing and the built environment, and perhaps Julian can go further into that, but I think one of the key things here is clearly sort of 
twofold. One, there needs to be a sort of retrofitting revolution. So if you look at carbon emissions, if you look at energy and efficiency in the UK, roughly sort of 10% of our emissions come from that sort of household and building uh, sector. So clearly we need to sort of radically upgrade our building stock. And again, that should be, you know, not just how do we decarbonize, but how do we make sure that everyone can live in the type of communal luxury and the type of sort of safe, well-designed, spacious sort of living environments that everyone deserves to have as a right, not as sort of market-based imperative. And then obviously the built environment more widely. How can we rethink sort of, you know, how materials flow, how sort of, you know, people flow, how infrastructure is designed, again, to both be decarbonized, but also to sort of create the types of human flourishing that we need. Uh, we also look to things like uh, industry, so the corporate forms, so how do you radically rethink and scale up more sort of, you know, sustainable forms of enterprise, but also reshape radically how corporations act in ways to like really radically basically break apart some of their concentrated corporate power and democratize those things. And we look to sectors like transport, which is in some ways the hardest nut um, to crack. It's uh, certainly the biggest uh, emitting contributor in globally, I think, and certainly in the UK. Um, so we put out a series of papers calling for um, sort of London of being a sort of private car-free city. By 2030, we recently put out a report calling for sort of the abolition of uh, fossil-fueled jet planes within the next few years, um, and a series of interventions around how can you scale up you know, electric buses and cycling lanes, et cetera, et cetera, to sort of have green forms of mobility. Um, and then sort of one of the other big ones we looked at was land use, agriculture, and how you can use new forms of ownership, new forms of sort of stewarding of the natural commons, new forms of rewilding, um, which again, Julian will touch on in a minute, um, to begin that transition. Again, the land sector is a huge and under-recognized contributor to our emissions, but potentially a huge source of the types of good green work and sort of that reconnection of sort of nature and sort of human society, which is deliberately disentangled and sort of made exactly that sort of abstract nature and human society, but actually we need to re-entangle sort of the economic and the natural and recognize they're sort of radically intertwined. And the final thing we touched upon, um, and maybe Labour for Green New Deal can uh, touch on that sort of uh, the agenda work you've been doing there, but uh, sort of what does Green New Deal internationalism look like um, in terms of sort of, and this obviously what I've been talking about is UK specific, but clearly a Green New Deal has to function as a sort of radical green sort of internationalism at its core, and to some degree, you know, the Green New Deal clearly echoes Anglo-American cultural reference points. And in some ways, you might want to think, what does a sort of green bandung look like? What would a sort of Green New Deal, but it wouldn't be called a Green New Deal, but what would a Green New Deal equivalent led by the Global South look like that isn't sort of anchored in the you know, imaginaries of 1930s America, um, but nonetheless, you know, echoes some of these ambitions as sort of decenters sort of the extractive and sort of neocolonial power that has driven us into this crisis. And a series of other steps around sort of how do we sort of do technological transfers and things of that nature. Nature. And the sort of, by quite a long way, the highlight of Commonwealth's six months existence was that a set of uh, uh, policy papers was liked by AOC on Twitter. So that was by a long way the sort of uh, you know highlight of the whole series, really. Um, but on that uh, rather superficial note, um, I'll hand over to my colleague Julian. Um, thank you. Um, so I've been working with Commonwealth for a few months now. I think I have, does this work too? Yes. Um, and I did some work on the Green New Deal city of 2030 and some work on how to rewild the UK. Um, and we, we did some work uh, with some of the researchers to, to help them v visualize and imagine what that might look like. Um, so I just wanted to share some thoughts on how um, how we should approach this, how, how, how we thought we should approach this. Um, because design is, in a sense, the last, the, one of the last the, the, the disciplines which in academia is taking seriously futuring, uh, prototyping, prefiguring. Um, that is, you know, that is very well within our remit and, and, and we know how to do it. Um, so we should really use that. Um, and I guess as architects, as urban designers, as landscape designers, um, we think a lot about the social and the technical, we can call it the socio-technical, um, and we can think in a multi-scalar way in which, 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 which are all really cr crucial, crucial uh, things to be uh, futuring the Green New Deal. Um, 
So I think our approach should be hybrid. It should be trying to move beyond uh, ideas of sort of growth and degrowth and trying to really think at what scales do we need growth, at what scales do we need degrowth, what do we need to grow, what do we need to degrow. Um, and what design allows us to do is say, design, I mean, let's take energy. We just don't think of the solutions for energy. We think of energy for what? For what kind of work? Um, for what kind of mode of life? Um, and I guess about that, um, a lot of the work with Green New Deal City was about thinking about uh, low c c carbon forms of work. So actually really thinking it's not just, you know, green tech, but it's about um, care work and uh, teachers, um, a series of jobs which um, in one of the books on the Green New Deal, it's been called pink collar work. Um, um, so that's all work which is very gendered, uh, um, exploitative, uh, underpaid. Um, so we really need to think about um, how we grow that kind of work and how we create the spaces in which in which that work can really sort of assume value and, 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 um, and help us all flourish. Um, and that involves also designing new spaces and new modes of negotiation in in the city. So really, really thinking about how can we reuse our ground floors to bring all the people who need to engage in the d d d democratic pr 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 process of redesigning everything. Um, where are we going to have these conversations? How? Um, and that's all stuff that we we should be thinking about as architects, as landscape designers, and as urban designers. Um, I'm going to stop there. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, on the screen. Okay, and finally, before we start the conversation, we have a Adrian Buller, who is a co-director of Labor for a Green New Deal, and now, as we know, part of Commonwealth as well. Um, uh, she directs policy for the campaign. Uh, Labor for a Green New Deal is a grassroots uh, organization dedicated to driving radical transformative action on climate in the Labor Party. In September 2019, they secured a radical Green New Deal, including an ambition of economy-wide decarbonization by 2030 as Labor Party policy. Thank you for joining us. Thanks. Um, so as Alfredo just said, about two months ago, we passed a Green New Deal motion at party conference, which effectively means that the Labour Party uh, signed on to a set of principles by which it would tackle the climate crisis in government. Um, I won't try and repeat too many of the principles and policies that entails. I think Fernanda and, and Matt have covered a lot of those off. Um, but very briefly, it's a green industrial strategy to achieve you know, total decarbonization by 2030. It's the provision of universal basic services uh, to tackle inequality. Um, and finally, a uh, sort of a core tenet, and which I think is maybe the most relevant for the people in this room tonight, um, is a commitment to um, broadening democratic public ownership. Um, and a lot of the time when that's discussed, we like to think of it as sort of major sectors like water or energy and rail. Um, but for us, that's this is more about, you know, a fundamental reorganizing of our economy. That's the essence of the Green New Deal, or at least Labour's Green New Deal as it stands, which is the recognition that we will only succeed in tackling the climate crisis by targeting it at its root, and that is through the complete transformation of an economic system that is hardwired for privatization, for extraction, and for the exploitation of both labour and of nature. Um, so I was asked to give the activist perspective tonight, and um, so I think what I'll do is draw on two sort of main criticisms that we get as young idealists um, doing this work. Um, and the first is that our approach is too radical, um, that we should be focusing on pragmatic, incrementalist solutions um, rather than advocating for nothing less than the complete reorganization of our economy. Um, I think someone actually called me a loon in the Financial Times or something like that for some of our proposals as a highlight. Um, but to me, um, this criticism is not only wrong, um, but it is an indictment of 
of our collective imagination, to treat as natural and as inevitable structures that we have in place that we know are driving the viability of not only human life, but all life on this planet to the brink. For me, there's nothing inevitable about eight million people living in poverty in the United Kingdom, a majority of whom are in work. There's nothing inevitable about the housing crisis, and there's nothing inevitable about fossil fuel infrastructure and about private car ownership or any of the systems that we are used to. Um, and that would be the first instance that we need the skills of the people in this room to push the boundaries of our imagination. The second thing that we're learning sort of from organizing and canvassing and knocking on doors is that people don't really know what the Green New Deal means. You know, they've heard about it, you know, it's a popular idea from a very popular American congresswoman and that's sort of the extent of their knowledge, but more importantly, um, they can't picture how it would affect them and change their everyday realities. And that's a huge problem and a huge barrier that we need to overcome because as the Gilets Jaunes have demonstrated so vividly, we will only succeed in this project if we are bringing people along with us. And so that would be the second instance where we desperately need the skill set of the people in this room because there's nothing more powerful in driving in a movement than for people to imagine uh, you know, how things could actually be different and to have a tangible vision that they can engage with that is radically different from the one they're used to. Um, so car ownership is a really good example of this. Um, EVs are often held up as sort of the pinnacle for tackling the climate crisis. Um, for a bit of context, EVs currently make up about 2% of annual car sales in the UK. Um, that's all right. Um, but the more important fact is that even at the point at which we reach 100% of car sales, uh, it would still take an additional 20 years for EVs to become the vast majority of the fleet. We just simply don't have that kind of time. Um, the other, and this sort of, this is what I mean by a lack of imagination, which is that. Um, it's, it's an easy thing to picture, transforming our vehicle fleet, but ultimately this isn't, uh, this isn't an effective use of our resources and time, not least because private cars uh, are left parked for 90% of their lives, or that we have 50 square kilometers of space in London alone currently dedicated to parking. That is a travesty, and that is a complete waste of a finite resource, and, and these are the kind of things that we need to change and that we need to have the vision to change. Um, there's nothing natural, as I said, about private car ownership, but people can't imagine a world without it. So I would call on all of you to help us be radically imaginative. Um, this can't just be about you know, changing current systems we have in place, um, but about absolutely transforming um, and building a vision of something completely different. And that is where we need all of you. I'll end it there. Okay, I, I think uh, we have some questions from the A Action uh, Girls, and also perhaps from Team Enet to start a conversation. And afterward, we will open it to the to the floor. And if uh, following your notes about imagination, uh, I just remembered why I was probably brought to this table because they brought me on last minute. That's why I was very confused when they asked me what to say uh, to say something. But. Basically, I think um, like my my personal interest within A action is mostly about um, kind of the culture of education and, and like how we learn and like our attitudes towards kind of learning and this kind of imagination. Um, a very weird way to string all three kind of things I've heard. Um, so. I've heard two references. Uh, you said that you put the image of the orangutan because you like nature and stuff. I don't know what, 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 what I, I don't know why you picked the orangutan, but it seems to be like a symbol. It's like, I mean, orangutan means basically forest man, so it's kind of like our counterpart, I, I suppose. And then you said that what would Green New Deal Bandung look like? And like, you know, another kind of uh, reference to like Indonesia, Borneo, you know, those kind of vibes. Um, I'm from Borneo. Uh, I've seen orangutans before, um, not in a natural environment because I would get uh, malaria in there. Um, but, um, and then you said something about kind of imagination. I started thinking about what would Green New Deal Bandung look like. And I, to be honest, going, growing up in Borneo, I felt 
we don't have the imaginative capacity to dream up those kind of things because we know inherently we don't have the political power to do so. So one thing that I found quite ironic when I was thinking about where environmental destruction was happening within Borneo, so I'm not from Indonesia, I'm from Brunei, which is the tiniest part of Borneo. And the interesting thing about Brunei is that it has um, an entire state that's pretty much just a forest reserve. No, pretty much nobody lives there. Um, there's only two states in the country, one half where people live and the other half where pe no, no people live, and that's Tumbrong. The interesting reason why Tumbrong is allowed to exist is because Brunei's economy is heavily dependent on oil extraction, and it's, it means that with the amount of oil we can extract, it can, it can support the entire four, like less than half a million people that live there very comfortably. So, you know, in a way, the entirety of Borneo and kind of like Southeast Asia had, through kind of colonialism at least, has inherited a legacy of kind of like extraction as economy. So the reason why we don't kind of slash and burn the entire forest for palm oil is because we have no need to because we're extracting a different oil. <laughs> but yeah, so like one thing that I was very interested coming here was realizing that yes, I don't necessarily have the kind of negotiating power as someone from that part of the world, but I feel like through education, there is abilities to allow us to kind of dream in a way. And one thing that I kind of got into more recently is this idea of Afrofuturism, and that's acknowledging that there are certain kind of realities built around certain people based on your identity, and to imagine unrealistic futures is the only way kind of out, you know, it's to entertain this idea that to experience kind of discrimination and oppression is unnatural, because currently in its current state, it is kind of seen as natural, and I think that's kind of the point, you know, because in a way the word nature is, originates from the word as born, and we only, the way that we kind of define what nature is, is the, wor the world in which, at least the, the stereotypical image of nature, as is the state of the world in which humanity was kind of born and not. So it's, we define nature based at the point in which we arrive. And in a way, with our current generation, we view kind of these capital systems as natural because this is the state of the world that we have arrived in. So yeah, we are questioning and changing nature in a way, in multiple levels. <laughs> So, um, so for me, I'm very glad to be part of this conversation because uh, when I deal with my projects in my in yeah, my daily life in university, um, I never really know where to start from. Um, so of course, I start thinking about. Um, how can I be, how can my project be sustainable? How, what's the best idea? Where can I start from? And I, sometimes I really don't know. Um, and also I feel, so I'm really happy that I have you here because I feel um, there's a great possibility for you to, uh, to be a sort of um, driver in a way or some, um, as a leader that we can, can follow. Uh, because also um, to see that you guys are so engaged in a real project, it really gives a lot of hopes for us. Because as I was mentioning before, one of the series, one of the seminar series that we had uh, two weeks ago was about eco-anxiety. And what came out mainly was really the um, um, sort of depression out of this um, period, a specific period in, in time they were living, which it's quite toxic instead of being productive, I feel. Um, so as an architect with a lot of will to learn, I would like to ask you if uh, there is a specific point where we could start from, or is it a full, uh, a full project in that needs to start in many different levels all at once. Um, I just say something. I mean, in relation to the Green New Deal, um, and if we think about how the New Deal actually happened in the U.S., how you know 
yeah, we, we shouldn't think about it as like, you know, we need to figure this thing out and then, you know, push for it and then implement and have it all costed and all, because, you know, that's not gonna happen and we don't have the time to do that. So I think thinking, so the New Deal in the US was a, you know, program over, over a decade um, of different initiatives and there were loads of um, shortcomings with that. So without trying to be like that, just that idea mm -hmm. of, you know, a package and a program of, of actions mm -hmm. is a good way to think about it. And so whatever we do first, like for example at NAF, um, we're thinking, we're collaborating with the Green New Deal movement, uh, Green New Deal UK, sorry, um, which is an organization that's convening, like working with the youth climate strikers and with Labour for Green New Deal and others, um, to maybe work out like two um, policies in the next like four or five months that can be one developed um, in a way like with places like maybe you know organizing different types of workshops with people in, in places and seeing you know what, what kind of ideas people can um, come up with um, what kind of issues maybe are, you know transport might be <laughs> something because it's so hard to tackle I was talking to someone a councillor from Brighton today um, and they just passed a motion um, Labour Council um, <laughs> they just passed a motion um, for the Green New Deal like within their council but now it's like okay so what do we do about, <laughs> about it like how do we actually deliver this and transport, she said, like, this is gonna be the main <coughs> challenge. So anyway, what I'm saying is, um, you know, uh, uh, you guys have ideas <laughs> um, and things you can do, and that will, we will require work at all levels, like at education level, like you know, like what I said about, like, there, there needs to be a culture shift. We need to kind of set the, the, the stage for the next generation, because the, the, the transition, uh, is gonna take a while, you know? Like, it's a massive job. Um, I think first thing is we need to just put power into um, creating that movement as soon as possible so that the ideas that are already out there, because we have a lot of the solutions already, can just be pushed and politically supported. And as we do that, we can all kind of bring in new ideas, you know, and new solutions um, at all levels. Like, education at a local level or a national level. Um, so yeah, just thinking about the Green New Deal as, as a process rather than just a one thing. Mm -hmm. I just want to add to that. Has, has, any, has everybody seen the um, Sustainable Economy Act? Is that what it's called? The bill? Oh, yeah. The Green New Deal bill mm -hmm. that, that, that was sort of uh, proposed in p Parliament, um, which includes um, the idea for a Green New Deal c c commission so I think it would be really useful for all of us to start thinking how our discipline and our profession can find its place in, in that structure, just to make it really real. <laughs> um, and yeah, just, 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 but absolutely we should start with the sort of place-based futuring projects are absolutely essential. And yeah, I mean, one of the sort of, I mean, I think the New Deal is historically, you know, there's lots of literature on how it's kind of reflected and amplified, and sort of lots of, sort of racial, in particular, sort of inequalities of US capitalism at the time. But one of the, it did obviously have some interesting elements to it. One of the interesting sort of kind of forgotten histories is the second largest expenditure item in sort of series, in some ways it was a process, it wasn't like an, a one-off event. But the second largest sort of set of expenditures was actually on sort of arts, culture, and sort of design. Um, and so, and you can kind of see this in the built environment of America. If you sort of, you know, lots of states in the U.S. have like lots of buildings, libraries, cultural centers, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, that kind of emerged out of that. And the sort of, you know, artists, you know, writers were paid. So there was this like explosion of sort of imagination and rethinking, and a lot of that was from pressure from below as well, um, and like left movements and you know tenants unions in the South and the Dust Bowl, etc., sort of pushing for new ways of trying to think through the crisis rather than just sort of lots of state money being thrown at it. So I definitely think like that archeology span of like what the New Deal was and what it could be now about imagination um, being fundamental to that. And I think, I mean, just to echo your point about, um, you know, sort of in some ways that is, nature lo no longer exists in a way. We've kind of like, you know, the Anthropocene obviously, which is much more properly like the capitalist scene, but like there's no, you know, nothing outside of ourselves really. And even the sort of pristine reservations are themselves acts of like huge scale human intervention. And which obviously to some degree is like, oh wow, that's kind of extraordinary. Our power, but also to some degree while 
trying to remain not too Promethean and humble, though, then it is like, well, we do have world-making capacity, and either we sort of, you know, try and repair the extreme damage of our current extractive model, or we sort of use that world-making capacity to try and build something quite different, and we clearly have the you know, capacity to sort of intervene in, in ways that can scale justice rather than extraction. Um, I mean, a lot's been said on that, but I guess um, a few final points is that, um, so rather than sort of a single starting point, um, I think at Labour for Green New Deal, our focus is definitely on creating as many starting points as we can. So our conference motion was sort of the seed in what is meant to be sort of many visions of what a Green New Deal is. Um, we used the phrase once, which is a bit flowery for a workshop, but I think we said, there will be as many Green New Deals as there are communities. And on the one hand, that's kind of an annoying tagline, but on the other hand, I think it's actually very representative of what we are trying to do and I think what has to be done, to speak back to sort of the gilet jaune point, is that you cannot succeed in this endeavor without bringing communities along with you. Um, and that starts with sort of realizing a vision that people can relate to that is localized um, and that sort of uh, is brought together as an overarching stream, but that is unique to sort of each place and each community. And again, that's rooted in sort of the design of those communities. Mm -hmm. Thanks. <laughs> To think of a concrete thing, like, you know, if you're thinking there is already, like, trying to build on things that are already there, like, if there's investment going to social housing and there's going to be a massive kind of social housing rollout, how do we make that a Green New Deal project, you know? What are the types of houses that we're going to build or how we're going to retrofit and, and all those things? So it's almost like we should make, I mean, the, the way we are framing policy now is that all policy is climate policy. It has to be. And all policy must deliver justice because justice is really the transition that we're living. We're living from a world that's unjust to the world that, that must be just in order to be sustainable. So um, if we think about it like that, then it's about identifying the opportunities out there in terms of you know, what relates to your discipline and making it a Green New Deal project. Um, one thing I always like, I think kind of the current kind of condition of architecture culturally and what we're deciding as a discipline is kind of like, I think one of the dominating questions kind of now is like to build or not to build. There are architecture practices that like literally just don't build anything and they just talk about architecture, research architecture. And then there are people who build and then somehow feel complicit or actually building a fantastic stuff that challenges it, but it's harder to build something that challenges the system because like buildings are expensive. So one thing I found interesting about how to say activism that surrounds buildings, let's say, is that they're not actually, like a lot of it, it's not really performed by architects. Like if you think about, because she's my idol right now, Rashida Phillips, like, you know, lawyer slash artist extraordinaire, you know, helping vulnerable people get into housing. Then there's like, you know, so many housing organizations that help house like refugees and such. And like the issue is not really the building or the shape of the building or the, the social house itself, but like the legal and kind of how to say the meta layers that surround the building. So I don't know, like, <coughs> As uh, I, I'm not an architecture student anymore, I just graduated recently, but like, I don't know what to do anymore as an architect, you know? Like, I, I, I was just wondering, as people who kind of deal with the territory of like policy and this kind of like meta layer of buildings that prevents a building from being good in a way, like, what do you think? <laughs> I'm, <laughs> um, I'm, I think I'd. I'd I'd like to bring into the conversation ideas of, like what you said, there are pretty much two types of practices, the ones that build, the ones that don't build. Yeah. Uh, we used to have a lot of architects working in councils. Yeah. Um, and I guess, I guess this might be a conversation for another time, but um, where is it, where is it that we think that we want to work? Where, how can we be, Effective is it going back to the c c councils and saying, "Set us back up"? Is it about? Um, I did a lot of work. Um, I did a lot of research about um, the two years of um, revolutionary g g government in p p Portugal in '74, and they set up uh, what were called bri brigadas. Technicas, um, which was a way of basically bringing 
top-down investment and bottom-up grassroots movements um, to be together. Everybody should really look it up because it's a really sort of un unknown history. Um, so I think we really need to think about what are the structures through which we would like to work and who do we need to place those, who do we need to sort of bring those d d d demands to? to, to, to. Um, yeah, I, I think, I, and I don't know where to even start that conversation, to be honest. I, I just wondered if I could just add something to that. I, mean, I, I think that uh, while I agree, I mean, very much, I think that uh, the current generation of graduates are, are put in an extremely, and students are put in an extremely difficult position. Um, and I think that uh, the architectural schools um, have led a charge in, you know, a commodification of space through designing um, products uh, much more than I think they have been designing um, sort of frameworks and sort of ideas building. I think that rather than to build and not to build, I think it should be, I mean, what is it we are designing? Um, and I think that Fernanda mentioned, you know, Green New Deal being a process, I think there's something very important about designing processes rather than designing the project. And uh, I wonder, I mean, I, I'm extremely impatient and I'm so com completely fed up with, uh, let's say, a sort of a waiting for permission to act. And I think that while I think the Green New Deal is fantastic, I do think also that everyone else used to get on and do stuff. Um, and I, I, I would encourage both my own students and everybody in this room to be hijacking the process of their um, design studios and studios and their units and actually designing processes um, and resisting this urge to you know commodify space whether it's through you know the architectural project or whether it's through the representations hmm. not to say you know that actually it doesn't manifest in something spatial or something very visual but I think we need to be very careful that we're um, focused too much on let's say the architectural object and if we focus more on let's say the infrastructures which are going to be addressing issues around transportation Transportation. That's sort of more of a, a spatial manifestation of stuff rather than me saying, okay, I'm going to design another damn station or that sort of thing. As long as it's down here. Um, uh, there, there's, there's a couple of things that I want to bring up that I feel that are sort of missing from the conversation that, that, and that can maybe add because they're places in the future where we also need to get significant amounts of traction uh, if we're going to solve the problem that looms ahead of us. Um, first of all is just challenging absolutely all of the core narratives that are prevalent at the moment. And they're, I don't know how many academic papers I've read that start with uh, the line that we are an urbanizing world and the population is growing, mm -hmm. right? <laughs> um, we really probably need to think very hard about the way we do low density better, th about the way that we provide low density urbanism for forms of association and ways of growing and building together that are much more engaged with land-based processes that empower people in local places. And this has everything to do with designing with processes and also I would say with relationships. That the, if we're going to get our heads around the future of how we design, it has to be designing not with objects and baubles and toys of the Heatherwick variety, but it really has to be with relationships. Um, the idea of the rural is also something that's that's been slightly missing from this conversation, and I think it's absolutely crucial. Cities are not all of the problem with emissions, with carbon, with <coughs> methane, with with um, with uh, nitrogen oxide, the other climate gases that are a significant problem. Uh, we need to think about doing agriculture differently and perhaps start to think about ways in which the rural can capture carbon and other greenhouse gases in meaningful ways and just turn that, that whole idea on its head. It's not extractive, but rather agriculture can be something that captures. Agency, justice, power, and place are all connected fundamentally in the rural and people are being driven off of land as a result of climate change. 
So that's one place that we can really, I think as architects and landscape architects, urban designers and planners, we hold the power of narrative, we hold the power of image, we hold the power of text, we know how to tell good stories, so we've got to make sure we tell rich, connected stories that read landscape as a continuous condition from urban to rural that is simultaneous and lived and occupied all at once. So that wasn't a question, that was a, a, <laughs> that was a bit of counterpounding. It was a rant. We need more rants. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, uh, on that, I think, um, or, or uh, let's say, answering the question of what we can do uh, uh, to collaborate. For me, uh, one of the strengths of our discipline is uh, the way we can visualize uh, stuff, no? Um, and one of the my main interests of uh, bringing you uh, here in this table is basically linking um, but it's called it top down with bottom up and how we can visualize that kind of top down might be represented here by the policies no that uh, perhaps you guys are uh, thinking writing uh, detailing no but they need a, a way in which we can imagine how do they look like no um, I normally put the, the example of uh, the policy of uh, uh, that labor I think is putting forward the uh, four days a week uh, working week no uh, uh, or, or to have a three days weekend so what does it mean for uh, for space no to have that no it would mean that perhaps people will require more leisure spaces no and, and that will be materialized into uh, you know cultural spaces uh, parks, uh, et cetera, there will be less commuting, no? Uh, the, the, perhaps the transformation that uh, the guys from Commonwealth were talking about, uh, about how we get rid of private cars, no? there will be, uh, the streets will, won't be designed for cars, but perhaps will be designed for people and for public transport, no? And, and so for that we need images, no? We need to produce uh, visualizations that explain to people how does it look that specific policy. And, and we can, uh, and I can actually imagine to see every single report that uh, you guys have produced, no? For every single policy and, and produce images to explain people, no? How, how, what is the space that these policies will produce, no? Because the space that surrounds us is basically the, the spaces that capitalism no, or neoliberalism has built in the last 40 years. Uh, and so that's something that we as, you know, as designers can actually produce. So we can actually talk to you and say, okay, um, there's uh, hundreds of policies that have been produced in the last few months, no, almost. Um, but barely any of them can have a specific image no? mm -hmm. uh, in the future, no? I mean in projective images. No? So that's something that at least this school and other schools are very you know, good at no? producing uh, images that project to the future on how those it look like. But uh, there's never this connection between policy no? and, 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 and the image that they produce. No? There's always, uh, once a policy is established, then there's, there's a process of uh, all the way down where you know, the design gets commissioned no? and, then, and then you just produce a product, no? as you were saying. But the policy is part of the process no? that, uh, that you want to explain uh, to people, and the same will go from the bottom-up kind of uh, processes, no? like uh, how to uh, allow other people to join the movement, no? to put some pressure, uh, and that's again the production of images, and as Tim was saying, like that's something that we, we should be able uh, to produce more, no? to, to communicate through that, no? and that's something that perhaps might be part of a potential collaboration, no? not only to transform the way uh, school teaches things no? through policy, uh, but also to uh, to communicate that no to 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 other people. I think. Um in a way, I would like to criticize the conversation that we're having right now, because when we talk about climate emergency, even in this moment, I, I think this is such a crucial gathering, but there is no notion of human beings embedded in nature. We're always kind of talking about nature as something else, and we're still talking about transportation and housing, but what about the nature that we're so detached from, and perhaps this cultural shift that needs to happen from the conversation we're having is how do we start to become intellectual in a way that we are 
we are part of nature. How, how do we enhance that notion of nature? Yeah, because when we are kind of talking about, let's say, like, what is politically viable, what is politically possible, and how we can argue these cases. Like, yes, there's acknowledging that we need to be realistic in order to make change, because if you're you know, too crazy, like it's not gonna happen, you're just gonna get dismissed. But then that is still operating within, and slightly compliant within the very patriarchal system. You know? So like, when you are arguing, you know, kind of like, in that kind of negotiating sense, you're compliant within that system. And I think we're, we're discussing in a way like eco-patriarchal systems, but not eco-feminist systems yet. And eco-feminist systems are not about being female, it's like valuing anything equally, you know, having the orangutan having a stake, every, every single plant have a stake. So yeah, I, I don't know, that's, I, I don't know what else to say. <laughs> <laughs> um, so can I comment? Well, first, the orangutan is like 99% our DNA or something. They basically, you know, they should have the same rights as humans, um, or more. <laughs> so um, I think, I mean, linking to what Tim was saying, like raising the urban, oh, sorry, the rural <laughs> um, debate, and what you're saying about, you know, the nature side and the visualization actually just giving me ideas. I've been, I mean, like I said, I've been just like, doing so much research and reading so much and talking to so many people about this. Um, and um, I went to a conference on indigenous, like that brought together like different indigenous leaders from different parts of the world um, in September um, at UCL. And that was really inspiring. Like I've been obviously, like being from Brazil, like I've been following quite closely, like how the indigenous communities have really, um, well, <laughs> They have a crazy fight, they've been dying. <laughs> um, you know, just trying to basically stay within their homes. Um, but anyway, I'm, I'm diverging. Um, what I was gonna say is that I think on the question of the cultural shift and values and the value system, like what I said about like, I, I literally feel asphyxiated, asphyxiated sometimes, you know, but like the, the value system that's imposed on us and how we inherently want to do things and care for things and, and value things. We have to remember that again, the we is not a uniform thing. We're not one thing only. And there are lots of um, uh, communities out there in the world and indigenous communities are, are you know, the leading kind of, um, voice for that, that live within a different value system and they're already valuing nature and the relationship with nature and with food and everything in a different way. And I think part of that kind of rethinking of how we lead this movement and we lead this change in a way that actually transforms and that delivers justice, it's first and foremost about like acknowledging that that it still exists in the world. Like even though it's dominated by the culture that we live in, they exist and the fact that they have existed despite, they have, they have survived, sorry, despite, you know, the incredible forces of capitalism and, um, and all, that is amazing. And what the system does right now is that it says that, you know, well, that's poverty or that's living, you know, in caves, you know, and, and actually women is a part of that narrative as well because women is seeing, you know, historically is more connected to nature, like Mother Earth and, and things like that. So, you know, tackling all that, and I think there's some really nice, you know, the solidarity piece, you know, some really nice alliances that people are starting to build, and I know Extinction Rebellion is starting to engage with indigenous communities, for example, but that we can do. And maybe it is that process, I was thinking like, you know, visualizing of the overlapping of, you know, of course you're not gonna translate like how indigenous communities live right now, like within how we live in London, but maybe there's something about the social technologies that they use and, um, you know, the, the way they interact that can be overlaid into like maybe forms of common ownership that exist in communities around the country here already in terms of com uh, community energy and, and other things. And then something else about the kind of wild urban <laughs> landscape, because you know, I know Julian has done um, work on rewilding. Mm -hmm. It'll be great to hear about what you think, but like, I've been reading about rewilding as well, and I'm really excited about it, but I know it has lots of challenges as well, and the rewilding movement itself in Europe has been led by the kind of, I would say, like the kind of old conservationist. Conservationist, <laughs> yeah. no, conservationist so. still, and it's like, it's great, of course they, you know, all, all these efforts are welcome. People are trying to lead with, you know, but 
it, we're not going to get it right if you know if you don't combine the kind of environment, nature, and the justice element. And I think that's still missing from the real art movement. But you know, thinking about the urban spaces as actually like how can we make wild urban? Like we need to make space for for nature, right? And actually. Um, um, the ecological crisis then becomes a part of those kind of climate solutions. And while you're saying, like, you know, the whole thing about building trees and having carbon sinks, and um, but there's also protecting the ones that are already there. Anyway, um, so yeah, I think there, there's lots of exploring that you, that you can do as a discipline in terms of helping us visualize how we bring all these elements together, and it's about justice and um, and everything else. Um, just a few words about the rewilding project. Um, I think the most, the crucial thing is that it's so much about ownership, in the UK especially, where I'm sure Matt has the, has, has the figure about how much, uh, how much of the UK is privately owned by... 1%, uh, I think 1% holds 50% of the land, or the land. Um, Something like Prince Andrew, for example. <laughs> Charming. Oh. You know. um, um, so, one that, that, that actually we discussed visualizing with Alfredo a bit further from um, compared to what we had done uh, is it has to do with linear forests. So actually c c connecting uh, different natural areas to each other mm -hmm. uh, with with literally linear forests, c c corridors of um, of green. Um, and that brings up a series of multi-scalar issues of, of, you know, of the kind that, that actually you showed at NEF a couple weeks ago. Um, but mainly, I mean, the, the, the ownership side of things is really, is really the sort of mind-boggling aspect. And, and, and I think somehow as designers, we have the possibility of just sort of making these really very simple arguments. You, you know, this park, this park, <laughs> in between it, and 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 it sort of delegitimizes um, somewhat arbitrary layers of of, um, of ownership. So so so, it's actually really powerful in in, in sort of undoing the legitimacy of these um, of these things. Okay. Um. Like. One thing I felt interesting when you were questioning why do these like indigenous populations still kind of survive in a way, like one part of the reason of that is because of like uh, like native reserve lands in a way, and it, I found that interesting because that's there's a parallel to what you were saying about nature reserves, and I remember Chus Martinez came and did a talk here uh, a while ago, and she said that there is no possible future of like a fair kind of nature in a way in the world when we don't when we continue to mysticize and mythologize indigenous people because we are essentially treating them as animals and treating their experience as just narratives and stories and like kind of entertainment to a certain extent we don't view them as equals and they are confined to kind of reserves so it's not even so so go regarding kind of like this kind of capacity for storytelling is that you know there are kind of a few like um there was a, there was a, there was a unit here a few years ago called Diploma 6 which was run by Liam Young and Kate Davies mm -hmm. and they were kind of you know the unit that was really like trying to go out there and like experience all these spaces where like extractive processes are taking place um, and I think that's great because they're they were taking kind of exposing the shape of the global ecosystem and the global economy in a way but then the point in which and I'm, I'm fine with the work they produce but I kind of disagree with it because the, the end product is speculative fiction and in a way to see this kind of the I, I'm, I'm, I'm really prefacing saying it's fine because like, you know, this is a heavy subject and to be really serious is like, it's like difficult for people, you know, um, to engage with that. So they, they introduce it to students through fiction in a way and that it makes it kind of somewhat palatable enough for people to engage with. But then in a way, this kind of processes that are global and very, very real is still kind of inhabiting the world of fiction and people don't embody it enough to act upon it like you know you just see this nice story with like cool visualizations and they they do have imaginations in which the world is more fair but then there's still imaginations they don't engage practically so 
when we're talking about we, it's also about when we're telling these stories, we need to really, really not, um, we need to be disciplined with how these, we tell these stories because representation is so important and also in a way what I'm kind of hearing on this table about visualization, representation, all that, it kind of reminds me of like, you know that Cambridge Analytica scare about them like, you know, representing certain information to help form some of the political mobilization. We are also in that kind of system of political mobilization and we need to be conscious of how we are mobilizing in a way. We can't just be so saying that we're good, we're good, we're showing, exposing, blah, blah, blah. We need to really like, be careful about what we say as well. If we're trying to use our skills and like profession to politically mo mobilize. Yeah. So. Can I just say something on that? Like, I, I think we need to give more space for other voices and that's one way already to tackle that challenge. You know, like I want to see like personally more conferences that is not me or <laughs> someone else. Who no, seriously, because you know, that culture shift will require that we open the space for those voices that have been perceived as not having expertise or not or being poor or whatever, um, letting them actually have the floor, you know, have the space. Um, and I like this conference that they organized because they actually flew and, you know, if we're going to prioritize flights, um, <laughs> prioritize bringing like indigenous leaders from around the world to actually speak because when you hear from them, um, you know, firsthand, then it's not something imaginary. It's a real person that has a family, that has a community that it, they're linked to. So when they're talking about how they live and how they interact with the land, you know, it's not me telling a story about someone who lives far away. Um, and I think that's really, really powerful. And in a way, like, it, it could really go a long way, you know, into changing people's minds and, and, and kind of activating people um, into being more... Um, engage with this. And just to say that you do the Idu Mishmi, Idu Mishmis, in the North India, um, it's a small community and um, they live um, just next to a nature reserve. Um, their community is not part of the kind of national park that has been set. Um, this um, anthropologist from UCL went to study the tigers into mm, this reserve. You know him. Yeah. He's amazing. <laughs> like, I encourage you to look at it. He went to study the tigers in the reserve, and what he found after his experience, that I'm qu cutting the, short, the story short, is that the tigers spend more time, and there's, the population is larger in the it is um, communities land than in the national reserve, you know. And you can see there's loads of um, uh, reports out there these days on how the lands of indigenous people and th they have, you know, uh, um, um, protected are actually some of the most biodiverse and most b best protected areas in terms of biodiversity um, in the world. And so we need to start looking at people like that and communities like that as you know, a part of the like they have the solutions, you know, and and we need to think about them as experts into something that we need expertise for. Yeah, it's so funny because like um, from Borneo, like I I do like I have a lot of friends that are like indigenous people, and like one thing is like I went to Tumbrong one time to go camping, and the camp guy, he was an old war vet in a way, like. And it's interesting because, you know, Borneo has headhunters. The guy openly admitted that because they briefly decriminalized um, headhunting during World War II so they could kill Japanese soldiers in the jungle. And the guy just, like, legit just told me he, like, he killed people. <laughs> and it was, it was part of his culture. And it, the, 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 the really weird irony when you were saying they were looking after that, so he was looking after the nature and then killing the humans, essentially. And that was his... I mean, I, that's still bad. That's still bad, but I just found that, <laughs> that funny. Yeah, uh, perhaps I wanted to hear a little bit about uh, uh, Matthew in relation to the ownership models, because I think that's something that, uh, for me, it's, uh, it's crucial no? uh, to understand different ways in which we, we use the space. It's something we use a space, no? whether it's urban or rural. And it's something that uh, perhaps is not, uh, on the one hand, well un understood. No? I mean, the figure that you just gave about 1% owning 50% of the land, but also the, the alternatives for that. No? Because um, if you have some uh, ideas on that, then one can imagine you know, ways in which it can be arranged in a different way. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think um, 
Yeah, I think it's kind of been almost deliberately naturalised uh, property relations and ownership and sort of depoliticised as a site of contest and like uh, exploration. But I think that's actually sort of that's a permafrost kind of breaking a little bit, um, at least in the conversation. Um, and so I guess the premise would be that populations are kind of like the gravitational force that kind of locks everything else into place. It shapes our relationship to each other, to nature, to sort of assets, to institutions. And that the sort of dominant models of ownership, you know, private, often very financialized, extractive, both from labor and nature, um, lock us into a dynamic that, you know, it's very hard to ameliorate and sort of intervene after the fact to address the sort of dynamic that underlying property relations that we have uh, drives us towards. And so that is why, um, and as you alluded to, sort of democratic ownership has been fundamental to the argument around the Green New Deal as sort of institutional turn to radically shifts of wealth and power, but also control and sort of how assets are used and by whom and for what purpose and to sort of bring in communities who have been sort of historically excluded by the dominance of you know, very particular patterns of uh, capital ownership and deployment. And so, I mean, what we're actually going to be looking to do in 2020 is a series of, like, quite specific sectoral Green New Deals, almost to try and really tease out, you know, rather than the abstract Green New Deal, like, what does it actually mean in, you know, rural UK, et cetera, et cetera. And it, each of those will be underlined, uh, so undergirded by sort of arguments for new models of democratic ownership, and that's not saying you go from, you know, a binary of private to a sort of binary of public, but it is to say you can scale a much like, richer ecology of institutional forms of, not necessarily sort of ownership, it could be commoning, so it could be democratic governance of a held sort of asset that's stewarded collectively rather than held individually or held by communities. It could be an asset for the community, so looking at sort of the work of someone like Eleanor Ulstrom, et cetera. Um, and so you can think, so take land, where you just have these very deep and, you know, deep inequalities of land ownership, but kind of, you can trace directly back to primitive accumulation, dispossession in sort of, you know, sort of 17th century England, and then, you, I mean, you know, we slightly laugh about Prince Andrew, but it's like kind of a disgusting, like, mark upon this country, and, you know, many countries that people like that control so much land from direct patterns of violence. Um, and then, but, and then you can say, well, okay, fine, so how do you then begin to mobilize and build the sort of alternative imaginaries and then actual institutional practices and politics that scale alternatives? And you can, I mean, one report, I think it's got a huge range of, um, ideas um, in it, um, which included sort of authors from ex Neffers and a whole variety of brilliant people was um, the Labour Party, a report to the Labour Party, rather than the Labour Party's report called Land for the Many, mm. which came out, God, it's been a long year, but I think it might have been, it might have been this year, uh, it's, it's quite, um, and it's got a series of brilliant recommendations at multiple scales from the national to the local to sort of, you know, regional, from things like a community ground trust, which would sort of um, slow, or oh, common ground trust rather, um, which someone like Beth Stratford in particular has worked on, which you can look at sort of slowly socializing land, definancializing it, and then opening up a lot more interesting potential uses of land, looking at things like um, county farms, bringing those back, which are new ways of managing land in common, you know, much you know, uh, more useful ways. Um, on that side note, um, there's a very good piece by Raj Patel on um, a Green New Deal for sort of rural the US, which both brings a historical perspective, because obviously that was some of the most radical elements of the New Deal, not least because it's the Dust Bowl, et cetera, but then also how you can then put that into practice um, today. But then it can be through to things like community land trust, which can sort of, you know, lock in assets and enable, you know, definancialized forms of social provision, et cetera, et cetera. So I think, you know, clearly land is a very peculiar asset um, in terms of factor of production, and I think we can't really do the sort of types of imaginaries, or at least take those imaginaries from the fictional to sort of actual practice unless we can kind of reshape fundamentally how land is controlled and owned. Um, and there isn't a single sort of uni model for that, but I do think any Green New Deal or any sort of, you know, more flourishing human society will rely on displacing current patterns of land concentration ownership. Mm. I guess uh, if there is any comment from, from the audience or any question that you may want to ask, There is this idea of, that has been floated about, uh, is it working? Yes. Yeah. About the need to engage new audiences and about the need to reach people that are disenfranchised nowadays. Like they're basically not the people they're already converted, but we actually should be preaching to the non-converted. Well, first of all, would be 
question ourselves whether this is something we should be doing, trying to fabricate those images to reach those people. And then obviously the question for the people who, who are close to policy making is, how do those images look like? What, what, how would we be describing the products, the images, the documents that we need to be producing to actually engage those people? Are we doing the right thing now or we are a bit sort of like talking to ourselves? How would you, how do we go about it? Do we just produce images and you just say yes, no, yes, no? Like how do we, you know, is there a brief for this? Um, to your point about are we doing it right right now, um, I would say absolutely not, unfortunately. <laughs> I don't know, maybe that's a bit of a blanket answer, but I think um, my experience has been that while people are engaged by the issues that they face, people care about the climate crisis, they care about inequality, they recognize these things in their daily life, people do not feel at all engaged by the solutions. Um, and that is a huge hurdle we have yet to overcome. Um, and so I think that's because and myself included in this, we tend to sit in rooms and dream up policy solutions and or design solutions um, in isolation. Um, and the biggest lesson to take away from the past year for me has been that you will never accomplish anything doing that except for you know some back padding about how brilliant your ideas are. Um, and in order for them to come to fruition and be realized, they actually not only need to be applied to people's lived experiences and communities, but they need to begin there. Um, so no, we're not doing enough now. And yes, that's where you need to face them. <laughs> Can I? Oh, oh, yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll be quick. Um, <laughs> I, I would say that one of the things that we need to be very much aware of is ways in which public opinion is manipulated or changed. Mm -hmm. um, and the way the world works is largely through processes of advertising. Yeah. Uh, that advertisers know how people work, know their primal drives, they're absolutely in command of that. Mm -hmm. Um, and if we are going to create change on a fundamental level, we have to get smart in the same way that advertisers way. are. So, and we have to not be afraid of using these tools, even if they're called yeah. propaganda, yeah. because if we have a good idea <laughs> that is good for people and the planet, then we should do everything in our powers to work so, with psychology. So sh shall we try to target with our skills, those guys which are nowadays glued to the tweets from Nigel Farage, right? Shall we be targeting those people? And shall we be using, shall we be thinking how to do that? I don't know. It's we, just we, we're in a really interesting moment, actually, in which eco-fascism is on the rise. <laughs> so, right, the, the, the right wing is about to take over the climate change narrative. Huh? And oh, yeah. they are going to, try to enlist people into sort of fascistic, nationalistic, regional, you know, and we need the regional narratives. We've got to have landscape-based realities, place-based realities yeah. that people can buy into. Um, so I think we've got to get there first. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and not be afraid. Really not be afraid to, to use persuasion, <laughs> especially if we have good ideas. Can I just answer something about that? Because um, what you raised, Eduardo, because um, I think the biggest risk now is if any of us who are already in the space or part of the movement or engaged miss the justice element, right? Because as crises start to mount and as natural disasters start to occur, well, unnatural, whatever, disasters, you know, it becomes, that narrative will become easier to break because people you know, I mean, literally, we, we're just firefighting, right? It's really hard to tackle challenges at the root when you're just facing that immediate thing. So I think in terms of like what the, the design community um, can help with in terms of how do we do that justice process in practice, um, is that increasingly we're gonna need, you know, good design for the processes to engage with participatory design processes and, um, and helping the visualize. So there are opportunities in the UK, if we talk about the UK, you know, local authorities are calling climate emergencies, you know, are 
councils are passing Green New Deal motions. So now it's like, what next? So, you know, people are, and, and, and unions as well. So I was with the PCS, which is the Union for the Silver Servants, um, on Saturday on a Green Forum, and like union rep, reps um, trying to learn how they can engage, you know, that, uh, um, um, their workplaces into the climate emergency that now the union has set as, as a thing as well. So I think there are lots of opportunities there. But people still don't know, as Adrian was saying, like we, we all have the will now and the understanding that we need to do it differently, but we don't know yet how, you know. And it's part of it is that kind of help with like designing processes and how do you do something that's participatory? How do you, you know, if you get a bunch of workers in a room, you know, to discuss how they want better working conditions and stuff, like is there actually a way to, you know, have a, some sort of, you know, participatory process to, to visualize like how the workplace can look differently or how, you know, their engagement, I don't know. But, um, but what we need to be um, also like careful about is that even if we de design a very nice, good, you know, participatory process, we still have the challenge of okay, people are engaged, people are excited, you know, they visualize solution, you know, they want to go for it. We don't have like the power, or the means, or to you know, like it's what Matt was saying, like you know, we <laughs> don't own the land. It's like you know, I've been working coastal communities, and it's like you know, the coast is an asset for coastal communities. But who owns the coast? <laughs> you know, so it's like I I've, I've spoken to communities that have been trying to implement different projects and they're like, well, we have like Bournemouth Beach, apparently it's owned by two private people or something. And like the Bournemouth Council has to like ask anyway. It's crazy. Um, so just going back to my like the context matters for the solutions that we seek, like there is the psychology of engaging people that are not engaged, um, but that must be engaged and also they want to be engaged, it's just that they don't know how and also they don't have the trust that, you know, it's so much history of participatory processes that don't go anywhere or that don't really deliver them. So I, anyway, I'm not giving the, uh, the solution, but I think that that lies the, the challenge or the brief, I guess, uh, for what we need to come up with. Perhaps just one more thing that perhaps concern more. Um, designers or architects is the, the fact that um, uh, the majority, I mean, right now, uh, as the procession is organized, it's, um, it's basically once you are out, no? the options for work are mainly in private companies. No? And so it, this basically means that uh, even though you may produce a visualization, you have a great imagination of how to transform, uh, things again, at least within our compounds, then you don't have power to do anything, no? because you work for somebody. No? So um, I think this question was raised the, the last um, uh, session we had, no? and I wanted to, you know, ask uh, around the table if they have any ideas about that. No, uh, one of the ideas I uh, came across was um, the fact that this, uh, the Green New Deal and all that we're talking about here is, uh, it has to come from a collective effort, no? And, uh, and I was thinking that uh, if that's the case, perhaps uh, one option uh, for architects, landscape architects that work in private companies is to unionize, no? Like to, to form unions, no? Because you're, I mean, they are usually protecting the rights for workers, but, um, uh, that collective voice perhaps allowed you to, to say what kind of projects, no, or ethical projects can be done by certain private companies, no. So at least while we wait or not wait, but while we try to, to change, no, uh, uh, to a green new deal, no, that perhaps in hopefully, no, if we have the means, the power, the movement, and the policies, it's implemented, no. Um, and the profession transforms into perhaps something that allows architects also to be involved in the public sector, they, they might be the, the force of how to collectively act, no? and, 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 and forms or uh, produce different type of projects that the private uh, is right now producing. And I think it's something that, again, we can rely on uh, the experience on other disciplines no, or other uh, ways in which uh, it's being produced, because uh, right now in the architecture, uh, discipline, there's no unions, no? Like, what, or there are certain bodies that should be acting on that, but they're not really that the case, no? And, uh, and that perhaps might be a way out, no? I don't know if, uh, and I think 
it's a, for me, it's an important question, and perhaps something that we should be also trying to answer, no, as a as a as a discipline. No, what what would be the way out if we really want to embrace ch this change? No. I just want to add to that. Um, I, I, after the last meeting that we had here, um, I met with the people who started UVW SAW, which is United, Vers United Voices of the World uh, section of architectural workers, which everybody should join immediately. Um, <laughs> and a lot of the conversation was about um, making the union a mechanism to refuse unethical and unsustainable practices which um, we also discussed it sort of through, through the lens of actually making the union attractive to a workforce which is actually not as concerned with their working conditions as, as other workforces because of the weird culture that we have, you know, that starts in architecture school. I'm just like, oh, no, it's, it's fine. I stayed till 12 last night. It was great. Um, but actually... Surprisingly, a union could actually be a mechanism to say, yeah, I did stay till 12, but actually to do a really shitty project that I don't want to do anymore because it's destroying that part of town. So actually, it's it's not unprecedented, uh, but it's it's always a very uphill mm -hmm. idea of, 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 of sort of how to have a union. I, I, I have a story about that, kind of in a way, is I, I was asked in a job interview, well, no, it wasn't really asked, yeah, it was a question, but he was, the, the interview was like, I see a lot of social justice in your work, and we have a project in like Saudi, so I don't know, like, I don't know how you would react to that. Are you gonna try and boycott it internally in the <coughs> office or something? And I was just like, no, if you give me money, I'll just shut up and do it. Like, kind of like, I was desperate. And then, obviously, I didn't get the job, but like, mm. I'm not doing that Saudi thing. But yeah, that is a reality that we live in. Because mm. the, 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 the practice was like, I'm sorry, but they commissioned this and we can't refuse the money. And yeah, we know that it's probably not great, but we're still do, we still have to do it anyway because we have no choice. But yeah. Just a, a, a quick, quick point on that is that one of the one of the problems that unions have more than anything is a is a concentration on the financial. You know, the strikes are always about pensions and things like this. <laughs> unions have got to focus on processes and relationships rather than just money. That's the bottom line. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Maybe I'll just I'll just add. I mean, I, I think I think that uh, we all need to be more vocal um, as employees um, because I, th I think that the staying silent is a large part of the problem. I think that we're happy as designers to be vocal about uh, the things which maybe we're trained to be vocal about. But I think that many, many of the things in the background the projects around the flow of materials or the treatment of, of workers, I think that. Uh, is our concerns shared by many of our friends and colleagues, but I think also shared by clients. And I think we lose the, let's say, the history of what we do being professionals and advising our clients. And I think that whenever we have the opportunity, I think we should speak up. Um, that's not necessarily, of course, it's not always an easy thing to do, but I've, uh, I think that everybody in their work now, but also, you know, previous generations have their red lines, and obviously there's some things that we won't do and will do. I think there's other, other times when I think we can push quite hard without breaking things. And um, there's also a nice project that I have in mind that happened in Japan uh, for the 2011 Tohoku earthquake. There was, um, I think, it had an impressive uh, and powerful impact on on, on the nation itself. Um, so it was not starting from the employees, but actually the architects who own the firms, because they actually have the power. Um, so I think, um, as much as we can, if we have any kind of power, we should try to to unify, like to collaborate together. So those architects were like Toyo Ito, uh, Sejima, Akiriba Wao, and others. Uh, and they collaborate together without any, uh, no one was funding it, but they, they, they saw a potential of actually rethinking the profession of, of architecture. That's why they engaged with the, the project. So they didn't get any money out of it, but they kind of, 
uh, saw potential for learning more for themselves. So they started to engage with the community, um, and they started a few projects around, and now Toyo Ito has opened, has opened a full project and a school um, that works on those uh, community regeneration projects. Um, and it's quite amazing, I think, the work that they are doing. So uh, as like to have them in mind as kind of a possibility also for us that we, we can collaborate together, not only from uh, really like from the, um, a rebellion point of view, but with a like, collaboration with, with, the, with the other uh, architects. Okay, well, I think uh, we'll leave it there. Um, but thank you very much for uh, your participation, Commonwealth, Labor for Green New Deal, New Economics Foundation. Uh, we are planning a series of seminars in the next term uh, where people from NEF and people from Commonwealth will be coming back here to, to the AA to, to explain in more detail some of the policies they, they are designing, some of the ideas they just explained briefly. And, uh, and hopefully we can also organize a workshop in the, in the future where, where we can actually put some hands on into some of these ideas and see how, what could be the outcomes of this. No? Uh, today was uh, meant to be more such an introduction no, to, to Green New Deal and, and to see ways in which we, we can understand the work they're producing and, and how it is linked to, to, to what we do. So uh, thank you very much and we'll see you soon. Mm -hmm. <laughs>